re- record keeping is, is statutory and it, it really isn't as hard as, uh, you know, people think uh, it is or scary. I mean, so, so, so some people are very good at doing their own bookkeeping. Some people are really, really, really bad at it. And some people just need training and then they become good, you know. Episode 112. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. And this week, I'm continuing on the financial theme by talking with Richard Mahoney, who is an accountant. He is the founder and principal of Claris Knight Accountants, who specialize in doing bookkeeping, um, setup of bookkeeping software, processing of sales, bank reconciliations, VAT registrations, um, and all the other kind of auditing and tax advisory things that an accountant would do. But they specialize in doing this for small businesses and startups. So very, very useful if you are an architect and you are looking at starting your own company or you're about to do your first year end accounts. Richard um, is an excellent accountant and um, has got a wealth of knowledge and expertise in working with small entrepreneurially led businesses and that's what we talk about in this interview we talk about some up talk about some of the basics of setting up a business and some of the basics of uh, accounting and cash flow projections and what you need to be aware of financially in your own business businesses. So sit back, relax and enjoy Richard Mahoney. So massive thank you to all of you for listening and supporting the Business of Architecture UK for the last couple of years. Big shout out to those of you who have come to our live events, attended the webinars and of course to those of you who have downloaded the weekly podcast and have been listening to them on your bicycles. And as you know, we love helping architects win meaningful and profitable work. But it's not always that simple to implement these ideas or translate them into something that will work for you. So what I wanted to do was to to invite you onto a quick 15 minute chat with myself. We can both grab a cup of tea and I'd like to ask you about what content you found most valuable and why and what you'd like to hear more of. And I'd also love to hear more about your business, and what you're building at the moment and where you are headed to business wise in 2020. So there's no charge or any obligation with this call, just simply to find out how our content has been of value. And if we get that far and with your permission, of course, what might be next? What what might be possible and how Business of Architecture UK could be supportive of that. Does that sound fair? Brilliant. So if you want to book a 15 minute chat with me, I'm calling these calls the BOA UK discovery call or just simply a chat with Ryan. Use the link in the information and I look forward to speaking to you. Richard, welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. Absolute pleasure to have you here. It's a pleasure to be here. You are an accountant. I am. You are the director and the founder of Claris Knight. Managing director of Claris Knight, correct. Managing yes, director yeah. of Claris Knight. Absolutely. Most importantly, you are my accountant as well. I am, so yes. It's, a, it's, a, it's, your... it's an honour to act for you, Ryan, <laughs> all, all, all these years. Yes. Uh, you're one of my, uh, uh, I'm one of, your, one of your architectural clients, and you have a number of architects that you work with. Absolutely. And you specialise and focus a lot on working with startup companies Correct, and yes. businesses. Yes. Um, so let's start really by telling, telling us a little bit about Clarice Knight, how you began as an architect, and then we'll go into some of the conversation around starting up a business and the, mm. sort of the essentials that any small business should know with their accounting practices. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, um, how I, I started Clarice Knight, um, uh, it was just, just shy of seven years ago uh, now, but I I trained in a sort of a mid-tier firm uh, called Weller's Accountants. It was a great experience there. Um, and normally when you sort of qualify as an accountant, you you tend to go down one of two routes. You either go and work for one of your clients, basically as the, their accountant or their, their, their FD, financial control, mm. or whatever it is it's called, moving into industry. Um, or you um, go down the partnership route and um, you work your way up uh, to become a a partner in the firm or another firm and uh, buy into it. And that's sort of your, you know, retirement planning, really. Um, but uh, but I, neither of those uh, <laughs> options appealed to me. So it was, uh, it, for me, it was always um, a case of uh, working for a long time with passionate entrepreneurs who, you know, you really see everything in, um, uh, in the accounting industry. You see businesses come from absolutely nothing to uh, floating on the stock exchange. And, mm. um, you know, it... it you work with individuals who are really, really passionate about what they do, uh, and uh, well, and really clear uh, about you know what their goals are, and 
you watch them over a period of time achieve that. And, um, it, you know, it sort of rubbed off on me, really. Um, it's sort of... Uh, it made me want to want to do it as well, you know, to, to quit my job and, and and go for it. Which is quite unusual for an accountant. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's and and so I think that's why I've always enjoyed working with you as well because you have this understanding of of small businesses and the sort of the risks absolutely that we take as small business owners and because you've done it yourself and it's, absolutely and it's a very unusual career path to. I mean, I've, as you know, I come from a family of mm, accountants. I do, yeah, my yeah. granddad was accountant. Yep. My mum is an accountant. My dad is an accountant. My brother-in-law is an accountant. Oh, I'm, I'm honoured that you picked me to be your accountant. <laughs> so, so I was like, you know, I was kind of, I fought hard not yeah. to go down to the yeah. accountancy. Yeah, yeah. Route. really had to fight against it. Yeah, yeah. And so, and so, and so to to meet an accountant who's actually broken away from the safety and the security of, mm. big, of a larger practice and, mm. and go down the entrepreneurial route. What was that like? for you it's the question i'm asked a lot um is is, is weren't you scared mm. um and uh truth be told uh, i would be lying if i told you i i, I wasn't uh, I, I was i was terrified um but uh, but it wasn't going to stop me uh, doing it you know mm. it wasn't going to stop me trying what's the worst that could happen well i fail and uh, i have to go back and ask my job back and i'm sure i would have found one um or, or been able to go back into my old role so that was the worst case scenario and i thought well you know i'm not going to live my life with uh, the, the the thought that oh what could it have been like um, if I'd just you know taken the plunge? So I did it. Uh, I worked out um, cash flow wise. I could I could pay my my, my bills for six or seven months, and I I'd, I'd be okay. You know I could still go out and you know, go to the pub and meet my friends and whatnot. I wasn't going to um, have to live a um, you know a, a completely closed life. And um, I thought, well, you know, if at the end of six or seven months I haven't got one client. Um, Perhaps I shouldn't be doing it, really. Um, and every time you get one client, it extends the calculation by another month. So <laughs> I just thought, OK, you know, uh, by the end of uh, this, this was March when I quit my job. By the end of April, I had two clients. So I thought, OK, well, I, now I've got um, I've got about eight or nine months. And I got to August and I had 22 clients. And um, uh, at that point, I, I then had uh, another problem. I had a, a problem of, OK, well, now I need to find an office. I need to find staff. I need to be able to service them uh, to the best of the uh, uh, best of the um, best of of our, you know, my ability and, um, and yeah, and that, and that, and that was the, the next challenge, you know, um, and I've never looked back. And how did you, how were you winning those first clients? It was mostly networking, really. It was utilising my existing network and, uh, and and getting out there and meeting new people, really. I mean, there, there are plenty of, as you know, uh, plenty of networking events in, in London. Um, a lot of people um, uh, often sort of uh, say, oh, you don't you do not do too much on social media. And, and, and they're right. Uh, it's because I've never really, really had to. I've always had a sort of steady um, inflow of, of clients and potential clients um, just from networking and word of mouth, really. Mm. Yeah. And so have you, have you ever specialised in a particular industry or has it always been... Mm. With smaller businesses that you're kind of absolutely, and, and that, that that is our special um, our specialization is is small businesses and startups. I mean, you you talked a little bit about um, you know you don't meet too many accountants that have started their own accountancy firm, and then then that, that, that's right. Most of them are sort of uh, old practices that have been around for a long time and have a have a number of partners, and um, and I, I think you know, my, my speciality or Clarice Knight speciality of small business and startups is because they, you know, they, I do find them relatable. I do know what it's like to, to quit your job and, and, uh, and, and start from scratch and how scary that is. Uh, mm. I know what it likes to, you know, to, to, what it feels like to punch the air when you win your first client, you know, uh, that kind of thing, the, the emotions, the human emotions, um, that, 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 uh, uh, play a big part in, um, the success of a small business or startup. It's, um, yeah. So as, what is your kind of, when if you're talking to a new startup mm. business, mm. and I know that you're probably going to be dealing with people who have either been in practice or in business for a year or so, or yeah. who are literally just about just to, starting, yeah, just yeah. about to take the leap, yeah, yeah, um, and then more sort of mature businesses. Well, you know, five years yeah. is still young, it's still still exactly, fledgling, yeah. yeah, it's still just coming out of the startup phase. That's really. about right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what? How do those differentiate? And what would your what would your kind of bits of advice be? The, for the first things that people mm. need to be looking up in terms of setting up their company. Absolutely. And setting up some basic financial systems. Absolutely, yeah. So firstly, it's a very bespoke um, service. You know, my, my first uh, um, uh, step is, is, is sitting with the, the potential client. Um, and and I, the first thing I want to know is how much do they know? 
Um, do, right. they, uh, do, do I really need to explain the differences between sole trader and limited company if they already know it? Ab- ab- absolutely not. And and you do that, you know, but just by simply letting them talk, you know, yeah. tell me a little bit about it yourself. And I, I listen to their story, their background. They'll, 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 they'll always try and tell you, you know, as much as, as possible um, uh, about their, their experience so far in business. So can we, and, can um, we start mm, there then? And, and, mm. and in the differences between different kind of company structures... Yeah, so, so um, the, 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 there's not a one-size-fits-all um, uh, uh, scenario. Uh, it, it, it's very much based on what, what, what suits you uh, as an individual or your business partners, really. So um, you, could, you could start uh, as, a, as a one-man band, if you like, as a, as a sole trader. So that's a, an unincorporated entity. Um, it's just you. Uh, and uh, the, the benefits of that is that, uh, that there, are hard, there are very small requirements in terms of compliance. You know, it's just one tax return every year. So you know, accounting fees are quite low, for example, and your record keeping, uh, you know, is, is, is pretty basic. The, 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 that, that, might, that might be considered a pro. A con of that could be that um, you don't have limited liability. So if uh, something goes wrong in the business, um, uh, you know, it's, it's your assets that are at risk. You know, they, they can come in and, you know, take your fridge or make you sell your car, that kind of thing, you know. And that is the benefit of, uh, or commercial benefit of forming a limited company. Even, even if you are just a one-man band, you can be the sole director and sole shareholder of your own limited company and, and be protected by what's known as the, the, the veil of incorporation. Um, so as long as you don't do anything wrong or naughty, uh, you are protected uh, as a, as a shareholder. They can't come in and, you know, that all the contracts, for example, in business that you enter into is is, is the company's contract. So so that that's that's how how you're protected from that. Right. So if mm. the company ends up getting into debt or bankruptcy yeah, or something exactly. like that, they're not going to come after you personally. The company needs to in, be able to in, pay. In theory, in theory, uh, with the things with uh, you know, when it comes to debt, often banks um, and lenders will uh, will ask for personal guarantees, which sort of takes away the um, the point of limited liability. So uh, right. I, 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 I normally advise against that, but, uh, but I also appreciate it's not always possible. Well, it's, it's quite interesting, actually, because in small architecture practice, I mean, I would say the majority mm. of small practice owners end up having some form of, li- well, they have a limited company. Yeah, uh, yeah, normally, yeah. They yeah. may have, they may, sometimes a limited liability partnership. Yep, yep. So what, very what's, similar. The, what's the difference between those two? It's sort of a hybrid between a limited company and a traditional partnership, really. Right. So in a traditional partnership, it's just a bunch of sole traders in partnership, if that makes sense. Um, with a LLP or a limited liability partnership, you're, you're still a partnership, but but you have limited liability or, or the entity has li- limited right. liability. Right, okay. So yeah. you, so you mm. can get together with a bunch of other sole yep. traders, call yourself a partnership. Absolutely. Is yep. there any kind of legal definition of that or you need to declare yourself as a partnership you need to register with hmrc um uh, as as a traditional partnership with an llp or a limited liability partnership you have the same or very similar reporting requirements as a limited company so you have to file accounts at company's house yeah um, that you know do an annual uh, confirmation statement that kind of thing um so so you have those those additional reporting requirements as well um so basically a limited company, either as a partnership or as a limited company, mm. is a kind of legal entity, a shell that kind of offers a set of protections. Absolutely, yeah. For you and your assets, or yeah. if the company gets into trouble. Absolutely, um, there, there, there can also be commercial benefits as well. Um, uh, often, uh, I get clients come to me and say, you know, I'm a sole trader, but what I'd like to be is a is run a limited company with VAT registration because it makes me look a little bit bigger and more professional. And uh, and, and that is a very very valid point uh, when you, when you're going for a certain level of client, for example, um, you know. Appro- approaching them as a as a company with a with a, with a VAT registration, it it, it does send off a, a certain message that you're you know professional and you're you know you're not just uh you know work, working out your bedroom um, yeah. for example yeah well, well what's the difference between why would you choose to be a limited liability partnership as opposed to a limited company mm. where you have a number of different directors. In the company, there can be there can be tax reasons for that. O- often, limited liability partnerships um, suit family businesses um, where you have um, different generations working together um, and, and different levels of earnings. Now, without going into the the, the technical side of that, um, I, because it's boring, it will take a long time, <laughs> and I'm sure your your audience aren't really that interested. Um, I, what I can tell you is that there are tax advantages uh, for, for, for for structuring a family business, for example, or something similar to a family business where you have people at different ages. Uh, for example, as an LLP, as opposed to a limited company, uh, where where there are di- different tax advantages, but um, but uh, but yeah, that, that 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 could be one. Right, mm. and so and so the process of setting up a limited liability company, what happens sort of stage by stage, and and how does it 
how does it affect if you're becoming a director what does that mean mm. does it mean that you automatically get equity in the company or you get shares or can you be a director and not have any so, ownership of the business sure sure so to answer your, your first question in terms of forming uh, a limited li- liability company it, it, it is very straightforward uh, most formation agents you'll be able to find with a, a simple google search it costs about 30 pounds and you just uh, simply uh, type in your details really uh, you, your details as a director as a as a shareholder what you want the company name to be uh, often formation agents on Online, we'll, we'll check to make sure that there isn't a company with already with that name or right. a similar name, uh, which 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 can cause you issues down the line. Yeah, um, and uh, and they they, they, t- they take you through the process. It takes maybe a day or so, and you'll get the certificate of incorporation through from Companies House and the memorandum and association uh, articles of association, which are just the legal documents that you sort of take to the bank, and from there you can open a company bank account and you're you 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 you're good to go. And um, to answer the second question you asked, uh, directors and shareholders, uh, it's a it's a common common myth. They they are completely separate right so directors are uh, officers of the company they they run the company and the the shareholders own the company so, right. so that's who they're sort of accountable to if you like and the shareholders they have the vote um so there's so a one share equals one vote tr- traditionally um and uh and yes they, they, they have the power to to, to, to vote the, the management the directors off the board if um uh, if, if, if they're not satisfied with the performance so so <laughs> so essentially the shareholders of the business don't actually necessarily need to have any any operational functions nope. within the business they nope. are literally it's a mechanism for ownership absolutely they could be investors um uh purely investors with with, with no um say on strategy um uh, they would simply just attend the the agm every year yeah. um and uh, and, and, that, and that, that that could be all their their involvement is really but um but for small businesses often the directors and the shareholders are the same people right yeah. okay so that's where the kind of the misunderstanding occurs absolutely yeah so. yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Often people think directors and shareholders are either the same or they mean the same or similar things. You know. Yeah. So, so what's the difference then between? So, uh, I mean, is it? Does there come to a point when a business will outgrow one of these structures that we've talked about? Absolutely, yeah. And w- when yeah. when would that happen, and what does it mean to when they, you know, what's the next stage of sure. business evolution? Th- 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 there's no th- there's no right or wrong answer to that question. I mean, it's it's very very sort of um, it's not black or white. It's not sh- it's, it, it, it's shades of grey. It's it's um, it, it it would be, you know, for example, it could be level of turnover uh, it, it could be um, that they breached the audit threshold and now they need uh, to, to have, a, have a statutory audit which is a uh, an accounting firm that comes in and really checks the books and verifies the balances on the balance sheet that kind of thing really um, that, that then then you know, alongside that you might want to consider the, the the structure of the entity as well it could be that um, the business is branching out into lots of different areas for example you could have uh, the architecture firm uh, that does traditional um, let's say commercial projects um, but also wants um, a, uh, a social media uh, marketing side to the business it could be that the the, the structure of that business needs to change and uh, right. you put a holding company on top and uh, the, the 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 architectural work goes through one company and the, and the marketing goes through another company yeah. but it's all under common ownership uh, and the reason being that if one company doesn't do so well it doesn't bring the whole group down if that makes sense Got it. <laughs> um, so, know, yeah. so could you explain that a bit more what, what a holding mm. company is and how that would operate so a holding company would be would be where um the that that would sort of own the holding company would sit it wouldn't actually trade um it, it, it would sit on top of all the the trading companies and it would own all the the, the rights it would have the, the insurance for example it would have all the contracts that, that 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 kind of thing and then the trading companies would sit underneath that they would they would be owned by the holding company so so when those trading companies make a profit and they pay the dividends the dividends would go up to the the holding company and, and then then go out to the shareholders if that right. makes sense okay. yeah and the trading companies what that could mean is that uh, maybe you have three or four different types of trade um you know i use the example of a traditional sort of architectural um you know actually actually drawing uh, you know the, the you, you could have a consulting arm where you consult to uh, to do other architectural firms or, or so on and so forth and and then like i say another media side to the business and all three of those types of services if you like sit in three different uh, limited companies and it just means that say for example if one wasn't doing so well um you could close it very easily mm. you know um with, without it affecting the other areas of the business uh if one was doing very well and you wanted to sell it for example um uh, again 
that it would be much cleaner uh, because that 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 side of the business would just be sat in one company. Right, um, so it's so nicely contained. It's it, it, exactly, exactly that. So, uh, so they're 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 often the motivations for for, for changing the structure. Right. Um, uh, when, when it becomes and, a little bit more complex. And really. so, does the holding company itself become a, a completely separate legal entity yes. with its own income and its own accounts and its own? Absolutely. And it's, yeah. And it's basically yeah. Yeah. it's kind of treating its other these other companies as business assets. Yeah. Essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly that. So exactly. something like. Um, well, I, I, the company that springs to mind is something like Berkshire Hathaway mm, of Warren mm. Buffett's. So that that's a holding company. Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Warren so, will have a, a holding company that sits, uh, and it, it probably owns about a million uh, other other companies uh, at his level. <laughs> right. Yeah. And <laughs> the, then, Vir, Virgin's corporate structure is also incredibly complex, and uh, I've, I've looked at that before. <laughs> right. So is that is that in a similar sort of thing where it's got a number of different holding companies? Exactly. Exactly. And they've got all these kind of hundreds of different types of ventures that he's involved in. Or all that sit in yeah, different limited companies, but under the same holding company structure, if that makes sense. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Fascinating. Yeah, it's really, it's really <laughs> interesting. This is, this is where I'm like, oh, this is, this is fascinating stuff. So you talked about you talked about a little bit about audit thresholds mm. and VAT as well. VAT is the um, the one that's more relevant to small businesses and startups. Yeah. 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 So an audit yeah. threshold, I'm assuming you're going to you're going to be looking at turnovers of millions. Ten of million. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You, as a small business or startup, in, in, unless you you wanted to have a statutory audit for some reason, maybe maybe some shareholders or your investors are insisting on it. Uh, I have no idea why you go down that route. It would right. just be an expensive um, uh, piece of sort of uh, compliance that uh, you, don't, you don't need. Right, you okay. Mm. And so the VAT threshold, where does that lay and why would people... And you mentioned mm. people might want to do it as an as a... For many as reasons. As a marketing reason, yeah, essentially. That, that, to, that could be one, yeah. To appear like you're larger than you are. Absolutely, yeah. What, what yeah. other advantages and when do you need to be VAT registered? Sure. Well, well you need to be VAT registered uh, registered if, you, if your turnover is going to be over £85,000, basically. So as soon as you you, you, you you reach that threshold, you have to register for VAT. Um, and you have to be set up with accounting software and you have to submit that your quarterly VAT returns to HMRC using software these days. It was right. a project that HMRC had uh, all rolled out earlier in the year called Making Tax Digital. And um, I'm sure all tax returns will be su- submitted that uh, that that way in the future. But for now, it's just VAT. Um, so, so if, if if you're not turning over eighty five thousand uh, pounds, you you may choose to register for VAT. You mentioned one um, uh, advantage of that could be considered uh, uh, commercial. Uh, remember that uh, you you now have to charge twenty percent on top of your sales. So if 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 you're business to business, often it's not a problem because it will be likely that your customer will also be VAT so registered. It's just, a, it's just something it's that in, goes in, on in and a, goes off to the ex- government. Exactly that. Yeah, it doesn't cost your customer um, a, 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 you know, more money basically. But if you're also um, business to consumer, um, that that does mean that uh, that you're twenty percent more expensive there. So um, that is something to consider there. The, 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 can you stay competitive? Um, but um, but but sometimes, yeah, like I say, if you're if you're turning over over eighty five thousand uh, pounds, it, it's not a choice. It's a, a, it's a requirement. requirement, absolutely. And and yeah. how does that? Work in terms. Of, is, it, is it as soon as you've got eighty five thousand pounds that's come into the bank, or is it is it eighty five thousand pounds in terms invoice, of like close invoice work? So as soon as you've sent the invoices out, exactly that. Yeah, the tax no, of the invoice. Yeah, right. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's in the month that you go over that threshold. So you have you have to register by the end of that month. Um, but um, but yeah. Right. So yeah. as soon as you've invoiced for your eighty five, exactly. it, it's not when you expect to turn over eighty five thousand pounds. It's when you've actually done it in that month. If that makes sense. Right. Okay. So, yeah. so it's not like you send out the invoice for you know, you've got the, that final five thousand pounds mm. going to take care of the threshold. As soon as that invoice is sent out, you need to get registered. Just by, by by the end of the month. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, but um, (laughs) (laughs) but uh, but yeah, I mean, another um, uh, reason you might want to do it without being under the threshold, you might want to voluntarily register for VAT, is that you've got VAT to claim back. You know, you've um, you've invested a a lot in maybe equipment or or computer software that where 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 you've 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 spent money on on stuff that has VAT in it, and yes, you know, you can reclaim that from the from the government. The 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 way it works is you charge VAT uh, on your sales, but you also reclaim it on your expenses and. one less the other is your liability or the company's liability, the business's liability to HMRC. Um, right, okay, so that so. could actually make some quite considerable savings when you're 
when you're doing that? Potentially, um, yeah, for, for, for a new business that perhaps has no income but has incurred a lot of costs, uh, it, it would be madness not to register for VAT and get the, get, yeah. get, get, get the, get the input VAT uh, back on the is purchases. There, yeah. Is there a limit between how much you can claim back on? So say if you've mm. made purchases at the early stage of the business, mm. I'm mm. assuming you wouldn't be able to go and, you know, four or five years late to be able to claim, say, look, can we claim back? Believe, it or, not, be, believe it or not, you can. Um, uh, you can go back six months um, for, for normal overhead, um, uh, normal right. normal business expenses, so profit and loss account expenses. Right. But, it, but for capital equipment, you can go back, for, uh, I believe it's three years. I'll have to double check that, but, but, but you can go back a number of years when it's uh, capital equipment. So, uh, yeah, right. things like uh, computers or machines or stuff like that. So, and it's interesting, actually, this, this transition to becoming VAT registered. And obviously, uh, I think if you're a, uh, a business and you you're working with clients who mm. say on either retainer contracts or if you're an architect and you're maybe halfway through a project mm. and then you realize that you're going to become VAT registered mm-hmm. you need to be particularly if you've got residential clients yep. and they're not yep. they're not using a business to purchase your services yeah exactly yeah you yeah. need to be able to say to them look this is what's going to happen exactly and the earlier on that you can do that communicate that the better yeah, yeah. absolutely otherwise you might end up Having to, you know, having to sort of swallow the cost, if you like, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah you're yeah. losing twenty percent. Yeah, off the, yeah, yeah, yeah. That does happen. So having that, having that clearly stated, particularly as a young business, is of course is, is essential. It's good advice. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Very good. Um, yeah, and so you would you. We were then talking about audit thresholds in terms of like if you're a large company, so mm. that's kind of talking in the tens of millions of pounds. Oh yeah, 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 absolutely, yeah. From your yeah. perspective, what is in terms of revenue? What is traditionally considered a small business because I always find this is an interesting statistic there, 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 there are there, there's no official definition is there uh, of a small I mean a, a small business um, I, I, I would personally say anything under the um, uh, uh, the, the the audit threshold would be considered a um, a small to medium sized business so 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 um, turnover from anything from zero right the way up to 10 million you would be small to medium sized SME if that makes sense yeah um, but yeah uh, there, there, there is no strict definition yeah, um, yeah. no I, I was reading something recently mm. that was saying you know any any business that's kind of considered um, at a level under 30 million is typically you know that's still a small business yeah it could, it could be considered yeah if you consider how much the, the big banks turn over and um, yeah well, um, Apple or something oof. like that it's, it's yeah. kind of mind boggling isn't it it's insane <laughs> so going back to the there's different, there's different types of thresholds, there's different types of company structures. Mm. Just so that we can put it in the context of small business and how small business relates to the larger economy, mm. what happens then with these private businesses if they want to become floated on the stock market? What is mm. what is what happens then? How do they how does a company that's gone public what does that mean? So, so it, all, all it means is that you're offering your shares to the public now. So, so anybody can buy buy shares. And, 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 and to do an IPO, an initial public offering, um, you have to have the business valued. Uh, so the, the, the shares come up with a, uh, a value. And um, uh, you, normally a, an investment bank will do this for you. Um, and, and, and you, yeah, you, you, you sign on to a stock market and different stock markets will have their different requirements. Uh, so, so it might be level of turnover, capital raise, that kind of thing. Uh, you, you know, you need to be a business of a certain size. Um, you join a stock market and, um, and, 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 and there, 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 there you go. You know, the, the public can, can buy into your company, um, can buy shares, buy and sell shares and, uh, supply and demand will dictate the, 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 your, the, the company's share price. Um, so it will go up and down. Uh, depending on how many people are buying and how many people are selling, if that uh, makes and sense. And why would you do that? Why would you do that? You could do it to raise money. Right. It might be that uh, you want to sell a, a, big, a big chunk of uh, the shares in the company to to, 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 to raise some capital to, to, to invest in, um, in, in in projects. Um, you know, that that, that, uh, that would be the main driver, I think. Um, it can be a status thing as well. You know, becoming a public limited company um, is now, um, uh, you know, we, we've talked a little bit about marketing, haven't we? And uh, what, what being a limited company and VAT registration does for a small business, perhaps that, that could be a consideration for a, for, for a bigger business, actually, you know, going from a limited company to a, a PLC, it sounds, uh, you know, um, uh, well. It's a, it's a bigger structure, isn't it? You well, know? it's interesting yeah. when you look at the kind of uh, how a lot of tech companies have kind of just ballooned, mm-hmm. like um, when they U- unicorns when they go, as we call them. Yeah, <laughs> or, or, or when they when they when they go public, there's suddenly the huge valuations that yeah. kind of get put on them, and the you know even that's the point where the you know the CEO can kind of step down and and leave and normally a new management um, uh, c- c- comes into place when a, an initial public offering is done and the the, the owner fam- founder sort of steps into a more sort of advisory role that's quite common um, right but then you look at companies like Facebook for example Mark Zuckerberg started that in his um, dorm um, in, in, in Harvard Business School didn't he um, and, uh, and he's still um, running the business now 
Well, it's quite these, these kind of companies as well, particularly things like Facebook, where they are a lot of the price then, a lot of the valuation mm. of of this you know this initial public offering. Mm. How is this company valued? Because I mean, obviously, this is a complex question. It's not going to be a simple. It is. Straight, <laughs> it's not going to be a straightforward answer. But it, it's it's important as well because. You know, on this on the podcast, I like talking about what money actually is mm, as well. Mm, and mm. when we start looking at valuations of businesses and mm. speculations, also when we're talking about net worth of an individual, we start we have to be realizing well, you know, someone like Mark Zuckerberg or Bill Gates or you know, Zuckerberg is a is a good example because it's it, he's worth like thirty five billion dollars or whatever. Ridiculous, it is, isn't it? Yeah. As a result of his large shareholdings in Facebook, correct? Which perhaps isn't turning over that amount of money, but is valued at that amount of money. So what's the difference there? What's... Mm -hmm. No, no, I, I understand. It, it, it is quite baffling, isn't it, really? I mean, the, the, the businesses are only really worth... I mean, th th what I would say is there, there there are a number of ways, technical ways to value a business. You right. know, you, you, the most common in the small business world is EBITDA or a multiple of EBITDA. So, and what that means is earnings before tax, depreciation and interest. Okay. So, so it's a bit like your operating profit. Um, so, so you've got your turnover, you've got your costs. Um, so it's, we ignore depreciation and interest on borrowing, stuff like that. It's your operating profit. And then it will be times by a number. And that number is right. normally quite industry specific. So, for example, a, a pub or a restaurant might be valued at four times EBITDA. So if their EBITDA was a £100,000, the business valuation would be £400,000, if that makes sense. Okay. Right. So that, that multiplier yeah. is a kind, yeah. where does that come from? Is that an, that's an industry agreed figure? No. Not or? really, no. Uh, it, 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 it's um, the, yeah, there, 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 there are no sort of published. Uh, okay, you know, here is the multiple you use if it's a business uh, in this industry that, it, that has this level of turnover, this level of profits, uh, and has been around for this amount of years. There, 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 there's nothing there that you will find. Um, it, it, more what you look, what you look to do more of is what what did our neighbour sell for? Uh, not, not dissimilar to the the property market, isn't it? Really, um, you know, what was the last business in in, in the industry? What multiple did they use? Well, that, that's our our starting point, really. Um, but you know, there, there 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 are other ways of valuing a um, a, a business. I, I won't go into them all right now. Um, but but one thing I will say is that a business is only worth what someone else is willing to to, to pay for it, and, mm. and and that is the the the, the final thing, really. The, the, the 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 economic rule of supply and demand is is, is one that uh, is prevalent in business valuation. Well, this is this is what's really yeah. interesting is because you know like like with like with property as a sort of material example that might be mm. uh, easy for architects uh, and for us to, to think about. You know, your property value will fluctuate. Of course. So as an as an asset, it's only really. You know, it's when you sell it mm. that it becomes anything real, yeah. real yeah. as such. And even yeah. then, it's you know, it's it's money. So you've got to kind of think about well, what the money's, what's the money going to be used to next? Yeah, where's it going? Yep. Unless the unless that you're using the property in a way where it's cash flowing, mm. and then you can value it as a you're you're valuing it as a, something different. Absolutely. Where it's kind of a multiple of you know how much it's actually turning over in a year of course of course and, that, and that's probably the the easiest way or the, or the one that's easily justifiable um yeah. to um uh, to, to to anyone that's coming in to buy it but uh but yeah businesses like uh well i mean twitter um uh, is a good example of a company that uh, floated on on the the new york stock exchange without any revenue you know <laughs> i believe that's the case anyway because that, no, that's that's really really fascinating because a lot of the, a lot of the tech social media mm -hmm. companies have and facebook is a similar sort of thing because it's 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 producing revenue from advertising yeah, correct um and from that but it's there was a, certainly a point where it that wasn't it wasn't doing much that, was, it, no. that wasn't necessarily and, and also it didn't want to do much like that did it yeah. i mean the, the 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 film the social network really explores um that um or, or, or how they felt about the business uh, in the early days it was much more of a social project uh, that became as the film progresses the the, the commercial um uh, sharks if you like came in and and said, right, no, we, we need to kick out this guy and do it this way and, and, and really commercialise uh, the, 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 the business. But when Mark started the business, um, you know, he, he just wanted to make friends, didn't he? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, well, and, it, and it's interesting because 
there we start to see the huge value in like audience mm. and users. Mm. So when these massive platforms like Twitter, for example, they've got you know close to a billion people using amazing, the, the platform, yeah, yeah, yeah. that is inherently valuable. Yeah. So when it gets oh, yeah. when it gets yeah. floated on the stock market, yeah. there's a value to that. Pe- yeah, people yeah. are like, okay, no, but there's a billion people in that. Absolutely, and, and that has a value in itself. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I, that, mm. that and I, that I think as understanding how value is created and mm. uh, and perceived is very mm. useful for us in, in in small businesses to understand that value is like you say it's only really the value of some what somebody else is willing to pay for it exactly that that that, that is the golden rule it really is um uh, yeah, I, I always say that um but uh but yeah yeah that is the case amazing very interesting um yeah so coming coming back down to kind of small businesses mm, mm. and if we were looking at and again, this is interesting with this conversation around valuing a small, a sure. small business. And perhaps a lot of architects or particularly in a startup company, you don't think about how the business might be sold or ending. Some people start with the end in mind and then they, 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 they know after five years I'm, I, I'm, I'm out, I'm going in and I'm going out and I know exactly who I'm going to sell to. Um, I know uh, exactly the valuation I want. Uh, and I can work towards that. They've, they're, they're very, very clear um, about exactly how it's all going to plan out and that's all in their business plan and, and they stick to it and sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. That's life. Um, uh, but, but also there are many people that, that, that have no idea. You know, they're, they're, they're doing what they love, uh, which is really what business is all about and should be about. It's, uh, mm. you know, do, fulfilling your, your passions. Um, you know, you're, you're the most effective at work when you're, when, when, when you're doing that. And, um, and, and, and they're very open uh, about uh, maybe if someone comes in and offers me money for it uh, down the future, fantastic. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll cross that bridge when, it, when I come to it, really. And there are many lifestyle businesses, uh, you know, just businesses that um, people do, um, uh, maybe on a part-time basis, so, so that they can spend, you know, hours in their, their day and their week doing something else, you know, uh, that, that perhaps doesn't pay them any money, but, but, but actually, uh, you know, gives them fulfillment. And, uh, and we have a, you know, a, a mixture of those guys, uh, yeah. or all three of those guys um, um, on, our, on, our, on our books. Um, so, yeah, there's no, there's, there, there's no one way of doing it, um, if that makes sense. Yeah. There's many, so, many motivations. So, so it's really kind of understanding the underlying motivations of the individual business operator and Absolutely. owner Absolutely. and designing a business that fulfills on what they want to be Absolutely. doing in life. And from an accounting service point of view, it's very important to recognize that because uh, what one service or one um, fee structure uh, would be suitable for one of those types of uh, clients that I, I, I just described, it, we, we would not suit uh, another. Right. You know? um, so really, really understanding um, what this person wants from their business, um, I, I think is step one, really, the, 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 first, the, first, the first thing you do. So, so what would you say or recommend to small businesses, uh, architectural practices, in terms of what they need to have in place in mm. terms of basic financial systems mm. to keep the kind of business hygiene up? To a workable uh, level. Absolutely. And, and, and what things do people tend to miss out or mistakes yeah. that you see? No, of course. I mean, you know, re- record keeping is, is statutory and it, it really isn't as hard as, uh, you know, people think uh, it is or scary. I mean, so, so some people are very good at doing their own bookkeeping. Some people are really, really, really bad at it. And some people just need training and then they become good, you know. Um, and there's lots of software on the market, you know, Zero, QuickBooks, Sage, um, you know, cloud-based software that can help you. Um, lots of online video guides and, uh, and, the, and the whatnot. Or you might just want to outsource source it and get, you know, pay a bookkeeper to do it that, that, that's that, that's very very easy as well but in terms of um uh you know so so, so, so that's keeping your records you know a, a list of your expenses a list of your income uh, and mm-hmm. the bank transactions as well categorizing them that's it's, it's pretty straightforward um you'll i would advise always taking the input from a from an accountant on a quarterly basis before you submit any tax returns because you know you don't want to to, to get them wrong right. uh, whether you underpay or overpay but you know but, but both are not good things um but uh, but in terms of um uh, the other elements to fi- finance I, th- I think for me the the, the the first thing is cash flow you know how, how how long can you go without being paid and uh that was the first question i asked myself back uh, you know seven years ago when i first started uh claris night it's like you know really really how long have i got to find the first client you know and uh not knowing that is very dangerous Mm. You know, yeah, and how would you suggest people figure that out? Like, what does that look like? I think it's really easy. Person, I mean, but, but I would say that I'm an accountant. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you are someone that, that knows what they're doing with numbers. <laughs> it's it's not too too difficult. You, you 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 know how much in a month that you spend. Just download your bank transactions or the last th- three months worth of bank transactions and work out you know how, how much you're spending. Um, is there anything you could take out? Or maybe I I, I could you know only go to the pub uh, five times next week and not uh, not six. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
yeah. <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, and then, um, you know, your monthly cost. Um, and then um, how much have you got in the bank? Um, you know, you don't really want to be going into your overdraft if you have one um, or by, you know, it might not be possible to to borrow any more money. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Um, but, um, but, but yeah, how much money have you got in your bank? Um, uh, they're, they're then divide that uh, by, 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 by the other calculation, which is your monthly cost. And, you know, you've got the, you, you've got the number of months that you can last really, haven't you? Yeah. 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 Very good. Mm. Um, so what happens at the end of a business's life? And at how, the end yeah how how what are the different ways that businesses can end you, you, you've never heard of business heaven uh, right? <laughs> if, if you've done very well you uh... <laughs> it goes up there's a golden there's a golden staircase <laughs> absolutely absolutely uh, but uh, but but no I mean um, you know it's uh, people people finish up in, I mean you know we, we lose clients um, all the time not through bad service never never through bad service but from um, you know people people either want they want to go off and do something else so they wind their business um, up uh, perhaps they get bought out by another another shareholder another person who wants to come in and run who's, who, who's got another accountant another mm-hmm. advisor that they're they're going to use and unfortunately sometimes they go bust you know sometimes they go into liquidation and there's a process for that as well um but um but yeah it's um it, it, it there, there's no there's, there's not one thing that happens really uh, yeah it, it very much depends on on the individual situation so, so can we think uh, a mixture of selling the business yep just closing it up closing naturally. up because you don't want to do it anymore yeah or, 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 or not having them yeah or going bankrupt yeah yeah basically yeah. essentially essentially yeah and, and so yeah. for businesses like so with architecture firms uh, and I you know I, I talk to a lot of architecture firms mm. or, or senior practitioners who perhaps are like they've come to the end of their careers mm-hmm. and, and they mm-hmm. want to they've had enough it's yep. time to to uh, that sometimes they end up handing the business over. Yep. yep. To a younger a succession planning. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Succession yeah. planning. Yeah, yeah, and they yeah. turn that out. Or if they yeah. are closing it down, obviously with the architects, there's kind of indent, uh, you know, runoff with our insurance. Mm, mm, so, mm. It, so, with a case like that, is that worth keeping the business open for? The period of time where you've got to be still paying off the insurance, or can I, you? I, I think, from a commercial point of view, yes, that does that, that does make sense. You, you don't you don't want to do anything that's going to get you into trouble um, down the line, really. So, um, you know, if if you go to wind up a company at company's house and um, uh, you, you you owe anyone any money, for example, that could be HMRC for 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 for, for, for tax that's unpaid, or any supplier, any creditor, um, they, they they can stop the winding up, uh, even if they're only owed uh, just just one pound. They can they, they can apply to, to to company's house and say, nope, this business needs to stay open. Um, it still owes me money. Um, and Right. be wound up you know formally and a liquidator will come in and calculate actually what what how much in the pound it can actually pay its creditors and communicate with you brilliant that makes sense yeah great richard thank you very much my pleasure that has been really fascinating i've enjoyed it and uh, <laughs> some really really very very useful thank you if uh, any of our listeners have got questions for you oh, absolutely i'll get them to email me please and do then, and then perhaps we can you can have you on again and oh, oh yeah i'd love to yeah. absolutely yeah please please do send your questions into uh, in, in, into ryan and, uh, yeah i'd love to, to to read them and answer them and yeah. if anyone wants to get in contact with you directly what's the best way for sure but feel free to to email me my my, my email address is uh, richard that's uh, richard spelled the usual way uh, r i c h a r d dot mahoney which is m a h o n e y and then it's at and then it's claris which is c l a r u s knight which is k n i g h t that's one word claris knight dot co dot uk um, so Great. yeah feel free to get in touch excellent i shall i shall put the link for that in the uh, information fantastic in the brilliant <laughs> thank you so much richard my pleasure Ryan. my pleasure and that's a wrap thank you so much for listening and don't forget to book your 15 minute chat with me by using the link in the information i look forward to speaking with the views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and i make no representation promise guarantee pledge warranty contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable